Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Kerry Stevenson. I'm delighted. A couple of months ago, I bought you Doug Casey and I've reached out and said, Doug, there's so much to talk about. The world is moving on its axis in ways that we never thought possible. Uh, Doug is the founder of internationalman.com. He's written a number of books. If you haven't read them, please just type in Doug Casey books and the trilogy that he wrote. What was it? It was Drug Lord, Assassin. And what was the third one? Well, actually, the first one, Speculator. Speculator. That Speculator. starts out with a bush war in Africa. And then we wrap it up from there. And uh, John Hunt and I are working on the fourth in oh, the, series, the Charles Knight series called uh, Terrorist. And I'm afraid that uh, events in the world are almost outpacing our science fiction. But terrorist will be quite interesting. I have a lot of contrary views on terrorism, which is a method of warfare. Okay, so there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. When when will that one be out, Doug? Terrorism. Uh, oh, goodness. I'd like to say six months, but I'm always, it, it, as those have listened to our broadcast in the past, no, I'm always way too optimistic. <laughs> Sometimes you're way too optimistic. So, look, just before we get started, I would urge you to read the the, the trilogy that's out now, all about Charles Knight and his um, his adventures it would really open your eyes in such a way that has opened my eyes. Doug, great to see you back here again. Uh, you said recently we're coming into the 11th hour. What do you mean by that? Well, the governments of the West, but most importantly, the US, have been living on debt for, <coughs> for decades. And the problem with debt is that some people owe it to some other people. And when you have savings, that's the result of producing more than you consume and setting aside the difference. That's savings. Well, debt is the mirror image, the opposite of savings. And it's like if I borrowed a million dollars tomorrow morning, I could live very high off the hog for the next year or two, wild and crazy. But then, because I've been living above my means because of debt, which which explains the stock market boom and the bond market boom and so many things. Uh, when the time when the time comes to pay it back, you suffer a very real decline in your standard of living. Not only what you've consumed that you don't have, but interest on that as well. So that's where we are right now. And uh, it's come to an end game uh, where these governments have printed up trillions, trillions of new currency units to keep the game going for the last few years, which has resulted in very high levels of inflation. Here in the US, I would say that we're running well over 15% actual inflation. I don't really trust the government's figures much more than I trust those of the Argentine government. <laughs> oh. uh, they've done that and they've reduced interest rates. I thought it was metaphysically impossible for interest rates to go below zero. But the Europeans have done that. The Europeans are even more stupid and dangerous than the US. And uh, of course, that means that anybody that's saving, that's trying to improve themselves by saving, uh, is being penalized by a real 10 to 15% per year. This is, uh, this is the way you destroy an actual civilization. And we're in process of doing that in many ways right now. It's very scary, actually. Uh, you, you speak about inflation and that destroying people's wealth, but you just said in many ways. What are the other ways that they are looking to destroy wealth? And why are they looking to destroy wealth? Well, one major way is the, uh, is, is the acceptance of collectivist principles, uh, socialism, Marxism, uh, Keynesianism, uh, all of these various isms that direct more power to the state and to central banks uh, over the years. Uh, this is very, very destructive of uh, wokeism, which is everywhere <laughs> in the securities markets. All big corporations now have basically rolled over supporting the nonsense of ESG, environmental societal governance it's all it's all crazy crazy stuff along with the other thing die 
diversity, inclusion, and equity. This stuff all ought to be flushed down the toilet because it's all destructive nonsense. Uh, you know, the war against uh, energy, for instance, the uh, fact that the same group of idiots with the same uh, the same destructive ideas are, are, are trying to eliminate fossil fuels. Fossil fuels are uh, oil, gas, coal, and nuclear. They're trying to eliminate those and replace them with windmills and uh, and solar. <clears throat> There's nothing wrong with windmills and solar uh, in certain applications where the other things don't work, but you can't run an industrial civilization. <clears throat> oh, excuse me. You can't run an industrial civilization on basically children's toys uh, so that uh, this is going to end very, very badly. What know, do you mean the, on, 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 on children's toys? Are you talking about windmills and solar panels? Well, windmills. These are giant versions of those little pinwheels that we used to have when, yeah. when, when, when we were kids. And solar power is like a, a giant version uh, of the magnifying glasses that you used to use to chase ants around uh, an anthill. I mean, these things are fine. And the technology has evolved over the last 30 years. They've both gotten cheaper. They've both gotten better. But they're both still uneconomic. Uh, they're really useful for specific select purposes in certain places that are amenable to them, but not for running an industrial civilization which is centered around cities. So they're, they're fine. But like everything else in today's world, they've been politicized. And what people use for energy should be based upon the economics of something, oh. not about the wokeness and the politics of something. And th this whole thing with green energy has become an out of control mania that's adding to the bankruptcy of the West. Uh, they're not doing this kind of nonsense in, in the Orient, incidentally. Oh, yeah, that's a really good point. Uh, and, and on that note, uh, I read recently, Doug, that um, in the whole of civilization up to 2020, we've mined 700 million tonnes of copper. But if we want this sort of green revolution that everyone's saying is going to be so easy to do, we need another 700 million. So what we've in, what we've mined over the total um, civil time of civilization, we need in the next 20 years. It's like they haven't well, thought this through. Uh, no, they haven't. Uh, and they haven't thought through the fact that uh, everything degenerates over time, including windmills and solar panels. And everything they build is going to have to be replaced. And a lot of the material that's been put into these things uh, cannot be recovered. And it's not just copper. We're talking about cobalt and uh, uh, silver and vanadium and all kinds of uh, uh, nickel, uh, all, all kinds of metals that are going to have to be mined. And the same wokesters that love green power hate mining because it seems like it's <laughs> raping Mother Earth. It's a, it's a dichotomy, isn't it? Because it's like they do turn around and they say, no, mining has to stop because we're going green. You can't go green without mining. No, and the problem is these people don't really love Mother Earth, at least not so much as they hate humans, hate other people. And uh, I, I've been forced to the, to the conclusion that, well, they've said this, uh, at the World Economic Forum, that the world's population should be reduced rather radically. And uh, the things that they're doing, which are making it much harder and much more expensive to uh, grow food, for instance, uh, well, that's not gonna affect you and I so much, even though they'd like us to be eating bugs, but it is gonna affect the poor people of the world who uh, aren't gonna be able to afford the wheat and the rice and the corn that they've been living on. One reason for that is because of this uh, war 
uh, in, in the Ukraine, uh, fertilizer is, is because it has been gone way, way up in price and is much, much less available. All, all the main fertilizers, the nitrogen fertilizers, phosphorus, phosphorus, potassium, are all much more expensive and much less available because of that war, uh, which incidentally is completely unnecessary. I guess what I'm saying is this, is that uh, uh, people that I would classify as the bad guys have taken over control of almost all the world's governments, certainly here in the United States, where we have actual Jacobins that control the instrument of the state uh, in Washington, DC. These people are really wild and crazy and they want to overthrow society. They're the same people as uh, psychological and their political beliefs, they're identical to the Jacobins in France in 1793, who brought out the guillotines and killed 35,000 Frenchmen, which was a lot at that time, or any time for that matter. Uh, they're the same people uh, type-wise as we're in back of Mao's great cultural revolution that killed tens of millions of people in the 60s. They're the same people that uh, were the Bolsheviks in, in Russia in 1917. This is actually very serious because, um, listen, it, it, it's not like what's happening in Australia or New Zealand or Canada or Britain. You know, all these countries have serious, serious philosophical and psychological and economic problems, political problems. But uh, it's most serious in the U.S. And if the U.S. goes there's really no place to run anymore because U.S. is the biggest and, and uh, it was unique. Although now it's turned into just another of 200 nation states that cover the face of the globe like a skin disease. Uh, Doug, you say that the U.S. Is, is worse than others, but the U.S. dollar is going from strength to strength. Uh, people seem to think that that's the only currency in the world. What, what, what do you think is going to happen with the U.S. dollar? Well, it's a paradox in that the US dollar is losing value against real goods and services at 10 to 15% per year for the moment. And I think it's gonna go up. Inflation is oh. gonna get much worse because they're creating money uh, by the ton for all kinds of reasons in the United States. So oddly, at the same time as the dollar is losing value at 10 to 15%, it's going up against other currencies which are actually worse. Mm. So uh, well, I think the key is to get out of currencies, which are all currencies, are just the unsecured liabilities of governments. Governments are innately untrustworthy, and almost all of them in the world are bankrupt at this point. Well, the U.S. government's bankrupt. It's, it's, it's disclosed debt is, what is it, uh, $32 trillion now. Uh, w w which it's actually impossible to pay back, impossible. And when interest rates go back up to levels that they have to go up to, something greater than the level of inflation anyway, uh, it, it, it literally won't be able to be done. It's game over and the government will have to do something really radical. Well, speaking about, I want to talk about two things there. You just said people should get out of currencies. If they get out of currencies, how do they live day to day? Well, right now we need currencies to live day to day. So I'm not saying, you know, close out your bank account and, and try to barter with your neighbors. Yeah. But I will say this, if, I will say this, that if you have extra currency above what you need for, you know, your daily uh, dollar expenses and victuals, you should be buying gold and silver coins and sequestering them. Pretend you're a squirrel with nuts because uh, right now I think gold is reasonable value, ah, not too expensive, not too cheap. It, it's kind of where I think it should be. And I've said this for several years. I think silver is an excellent speculative vehicle right now. I like silver as a speculation. So that's what they should be doing. And now is an excellent time to uh, 
accumulate the shares of uh, gold and silver and uranium mining companies. And of course, um, most of these little mining companies are, are, are basically crap. I mean, they really, they really are. Most of them have no right to be public. But um, still, at some point, the worm is going to turn and the public will go into these things as a, in a speculative mania. At least it's happened so many times in the last 50 years. I don't think that'll stop now. So I'm accumulating uh, uh, junior mining companies. Explorers, well, yes. Developers, more yes. And uh, producers, uh, most of all, because I'll move first. Uh, producers will move first. I'll tell you what moved yesterday on September the 14th, 2022. I'm putting the date in there because people might watch this uh, sometime down the track. The share market here in Australia, and I guess uh, the Dow also here in Australia, though we shed $60 billion in approximately 10 minutes, is what I'd like to know is what's your view on the share market? You just talked about gold equities and and, and, and uranium equities. What way is this market going to go? And is, is certain sectors of the market what you're looking at saying, you know, this is the sector to go in because even if the market does go down by 60 billion, you may have a sort of a moat around your sector. Right. Well, same thing happened here in the US, of course, on a much grander scale because we have uh, 10 times the population uh, of Australia. So multiply everything by 10, more or less. Um, how cheap can the market get? And is the market going to get cheaper? The last time there was a real market bottom, a secular market bottom, was in the early 1980s when interest rates were 15 to 20%. That's what they were back in the early 80s, 15 to 20%. And the stock market reflected that fact. Dividend yields uh, across the board in the stock market of stocks that paid dividends probably eight, nine percent utility stocks were paying 15 percent in current dividends back then. Yes. Well, I got a better one for you. Most people are just completely unaware of this. But uh, back in the mid 1980s, uh, three markets that I watched at that time, Hong Kong, Spain and Belgium, all three were yielding in their major averages. 15% in dividends, uh, selling at three, four times earnings and half of book value. That's how cheap stocks can get. Now, since then, uh, all of the governments of the world have been creating giant amounts of debt and giant amounts of currency. And that has flowed into the stock and bond markets. So we've had a 40 year bull market. It's actually just recently, it was not just a bubble, it was a hyper bubble. My guess is the next stop uh, with, with the greater depression, which is what we're facing at this point. Uh, and I've said this before, but let me repeat it. It's gonna be much worse and much different and much longer lasting than the unpleasantness of 1929 to 1946. Wow. Uh, I think we're looking at much lower equity values over time. I mean, the government's going to keep up printing up currency and try to maintain uh, the levels of the markets. The last thing they need is a financial meltdown and catastrophe in addition to all the other things that are going on in the world today. But still, we're in a secular bear market, I think, and it's going to last, my guess is <clears throat> five to 10 years. So uh, I have no interest in most stocks. And I'm even cautious about uh, mining and energy stocks because they're also stocks, uh, even though they're going to be in areas that the companies that produce them are gonna be doing well. So you said you, you said that you quite, you, you think gold equity, you know, the gold and the uranium areas will be good equity wise, but then in the same you're saying, but, I, but stay away from them. So I'm a bit confused. Okay, well, they're cheap right now uh, for a couple of reasons, but a very big reason 
<clears throat> is the ESG thing that um, the big money managers and the funds, the mutual funds and the big banks and uh, the big money uh, are all staying away <clears throat> from these things because they're not deemed as being ESG DIE friendly. Uh, give you an idea, back in 1980, the S&P 500, 30% of its composition was energy stocks, oil, oil services, things of that nature, 1980. That was the peak of the oil boom. Now, uh, they've doubled in the last year approximately, but from a level where they've gone down to 3% of oh, the wow. S&P 500. I mean, it's been very bad for them. They're very cheap at this point. Look, one stock that I've been in for some time is Petrobras. That's the national oil company of Brazil. Brazil. Yeah. Uh, it's selling at four times earnings and last year paid a 25% dividend. Goodness gracious. I mean, so, but people aren't aware of that because their brokers are directing them away from energy producers, they say, no, no, the future is going to be green and, uh, you know, oil and coal and uranium. These are dead ducks. So stay away from them. Well, that's exactly the opposite of the truth. So um, <clears throat> that's why they're so cheap, because the the, the public has been scared away and, and the big guys are brainwashed by this ESG DIE mania. So I, that's what I'm buying right now, those things. So, but, you're, you're, you know, look, as Richard Russell said, and I don't know if many of your viewers know who he was, but, but he said that during a depression, uh, everybody loses. The winner is just the person that loses the least. So in a depression, I define it. Forget about this two quarters of lower GNP. Forget about that. The depression is a period of time when most people's standard of living drops significantly. And that's what's going to be going on for the next 10 years. And you're going to see it with this cold winter in Europe and uh, a starving time in the third world where people can't afford to have food in poor countries. So it's just starting. And the natives will get restless. And I don't know what we're going to see in the way of riots and bank runs and God knows what else. I tend to agree with you. Um, you're speaking about inflation, and one of the things you've said in the past is that um, inflation is the worst kind of tax. But Biden, your your president over there, has talked about an Inflation Reduction Act. What's that all about? Don't oh, this is, this is absolutely horrible. Uh, I don't know how much you guys have heard about this uh, down under, but... <clears throat> It's a spending program of um, oh, about $400 billion. It's a lot of money because uh, World War II cost the United States about $270 billion, to put it in proportion, even though the dollar is not worth what it was in World War II. It's a lot of money. And what are they going to do? Why, why, how can they spend $400 billion mostly to fight global warming, which is basically... Uh, a, a, a sham <laughs> and a hoax. But most of that $400 billion is going to be directed to fight global warming. Oh, uh, no. But how can it be inflation reduction if you're going to literally have to print up because you can't tax? That's There's already a trillion dollar deficit. They can't tax another $400 billion for that. So how can it be inflation reduction when they're spending an extra $400 billion? Well, it's because that $400 billion is going to go in the top of the funnel towards politically favored areas in global warming and this type of nonsense. And they're planning on taking it out the bottom of the funnel in taxes, actually, from politically disfavored classes and industries. So they create... 400 billion, spend it, and they pull it out from people that they don't like, basically, at the bottom. It's called modern monetary theory. And what it means is the government gets much, much more control over the economy. It's Keynesianism, the worst aspects of Keynesianism, on steroids. So 
That's what's what that's all about. But it's worse than that here in the United States, because I don't think most Aussies and Kiwis know what Biden did on September 1st. But I'll send you a link to that. Okay. And people have to watch this. He gave a speech. I should say it's a rant, actually, uh, in Philadelphia, uh, in front of Constitution Hall, which is the founding place of the United States, Philadelphia. That's where it all began, actually. And it was a black background, essentially, very dark, with dark with red highlights. So here we have this is like this is like that scene out of V for Vendetta or oh, wow. from 84, where Biden is giving this rant, which he'd rehearsed uh, many times, obviously, because he didn't stumble all over himself as he usually does. He's got this terrifying background with two U.S. Marines uh, kind of showing his power. This is unprecedented in American history that he would give such a speech in such a place with such a actually terrifying background. And what was the speech about? It was almost all, it was basically a declaration of civil war where he said, and you can listen to it yourself, that roughly the half of the country that voted Republican, that voted for Trump are- uh, Crazy. Are, well, crazy, uh, dangerous, lunatic, um, uh, trying to overthrow uh, the essence. Of, he went on and on. And this was actually terrifying because this guy and, and the uh, people in back of him have control of the apparatus of the state. And it's about the same time that they had this raid on Trump's house in Florida. And shortly thereafter, uh, about 50 well-known Republicans, Trump supporters, of course, were rounded up, uh, dawn raids and perp walked in handcuffs for nothing. Uh, and this is on top of the fact that the so-called insurrection on January 6th of, of 2020. Oh, yeah. I mean, this was nothing but a crowd that got overenthusiastic, uh, unarmed, did no damage, were invited into the Capitol, were polite, didn't destroy anything. And there are still people, uh, many of them, that are in jail and being held without habeas corpus. I don't know how long they're gonna be there. This, this is all unprecedented in the US and really, really scary. Why do you think on September the 1st, he gave that speech? Why did he pick September the 1st? I don't know if there's any particular significance to that day. But the nature of the speech, which is terrifying, actually, and the visuals around the speech, uh, it amounted to a declaration of civil war on the part of these people. I mean, as I said, I didn't say these people were Jacobins uh, just to sound inflammatory. Uh, they really are. They're a reincarnation of those people. It's not a, I know you're, you're speaking to me today from Virginia, uh, but you also have a place in Uruguay. Does it make you feel like it's <laughs> to get out of Dodge, I guess? I feel a lot more comfortable these days in, in uh, Uruguay, <clears throat> which is politically very neutral. Uh, and they don't care about me anyway. I mean, you know, I'm a, I'm a gringo. I, I, I support some local workers. They don't care what I think or say. They don't understand it because I speak English. I speak Spanish, but terrible Spanish, quite frankly. So, yeah, I feel a lot better there because uh, at this point, since they started their phony war on terror uh, after the 911 event 20 years ago, um, uh, you've got to be careful increasingly. Uh, who you talk to and what you say, oh, because people funny. have have this meme about see something, say something in their minds. And Biden's speech was essentially a declaration of war, uh, followed up by the Minister of Homeland Security. What the hell is that guy's name? I'll send you a link to that too. 
where he's saying that, yes, we used to look out for Muslim terrorists and then we uh, abroad and then we looked out for foreign terrorists in the U.S. Now we're looking out for Homeland. for Native American terrorists that have been infected with, you know, anti-government ideas or pro-freedom ideas, actually. Wow, so that is frightening. Oh, it is. So the answer to your question is, is I really enjoy being in the U.S. It's got so many advantages. But um, this is one of those times, as I said before, that's happened in different countries from time to time. And if you were a German in 1933 uh, and you saw what happened that year, what are you going to do? Well, it turns out that a smart German would have gotten out of Dodge, okay? If you were a Cambodian in 1975, hmm, you should have gotten out of Cambodia. And, uh, and so it goes. If you, were if you were Chinese after Mao took over, hmm, should I stick around in China or go someplace else? Well, we know what the answer is now. And I'm afraid that the US has turned a corner. And that speech that Biden gave, gave was, uh, it was an announcement of what's going on. Oh. It was a declaration by the sound of it. Oh, I think it was, but everybody should listen to it for themselves and, and decide if uh, I'm, if I'm being um, uh, inflammatory I'm over this or not. I don't think so. Okay, well, I'll, I'll, I'll make sure I get the link. I'll put it down in the commentary below. I'll ask Philip to do that. Um, one of the things I just I just want to focus back in on um, growing and protecting wealth, if you like, Doug, because one of the things last time we spoke, you said, let me tell you, if you've got bonds, I would sell them tomorrow morning. Is that your, still yes. your bonds? Uh, I believe I was correct to have said that then because the... Uh, I remain short bonds on the futures market, and they're lower now than they were then. And when we talk the next time, I trust there will be a next time, mm -hmm. uh, I suspect they'll be lower once again. Interest rates over the long term uh, are headed back up to the 15 or 20 percent level Goodness. that we saw in the early 1980s. So yes, if you have bonds, sell them yesterday if you can. and. Uh, you know, uh, be very, very selective on your stocks. I mean, the time will come again, which I look forward to, to buying common industrial stocks. But probably when that happens, we're going to see average dividend yields of you know, six, eight, ten percent or more. Uh, I mean, look, I'll give you another example from history that uh, most people are completely unaware of. This is where I made my well. Yeah, it was just about my first hit in the market. Uh, in 1976, there were in South Africa, there were riots in Soweto, mm -hmm. and gold had gone from $200, which it hit, you know, it went from $35 to, to uh, $200 in uh, 1973, yeah. back to $100 in yeah. 1976. Rioting in Soweto, gold fell in half. Uh, South African gold mines. Of the short life, long life, uh, short, sh high cost, short life mines. Names that nobody will remember, like Grootvie, Stillfontein, Leslie, Bracken. Those stocks had current dividend yields of 50 to 70% current dividend yields at that point in 1976. And as gold went to 800 from 76 to 80, those dividends doubled and redoubled and doubled again. And wow. the stocks just, uh, the stocks exploded. And that was the one time in my life I bought something dead flat at the bottom. I could tell you how it happened, but you know, it's, you know, it was an accident. I just got lucky and it wasn't for a lot of money, but it was all the money I had. So, uh, well, so, so do you, do, are, you, are you suggesting that that may happen again? Not maybe not so explosive, but, I, I'm just I'm just saying that things can get cheaper than you can imagine, and then they can get more expensive than you can imagine. And people will recall uh, the internet bubble mm -hmm. back in 2000, and then the more recent bubble 
uh, where all these meme stocks, you know, the earnings aren't even considered. Uh, they're worth multiples, multiple billions of dollars, and they have multiple billions of losses with no prospect of ever turning around. So how expensive can something get? Well, it wasn't just a bubble. It was a hyper bubble. So uh, they can get cheaper than you can imagine and more expensive than you can imagine. And right now, I think gold is reasonably priced, but it's going up. It's definitely going up. I mean, the next step is up, not down. Uh, more so for silver, definitely for uranium, same thing at $50 or whatever it is right now. It's at or below, depending on which mine we're looking at and how you account uh, cost of production. And I think the world will turn back to nuclear power because there's no other reasonable alternative at this point. Uh, and I think oil is going to stay at these levels and go higher and natural gas, definitely. And those poor Europeans, they're going to have a, a cold winter. I don't see how they can turn this thing around in time. And the war in the Ukraine, uh, it's, it's, it's really a pity. I mean, we shouldn't even have to care about it other than just saying, oh, that's too bad. But we, here we have two shithole countries, which is what Russia and Ukraine are, having a border war. And this border wars have gone on in the Ukraine and thereabouts for a thousand years. That's why they call it the Ukraine. That means borderland. And that's where oh, wow. the name of the country comes from. Uh, it's, its name has been changed from the Ukraine to Ukraine to kind of legitimize the place. But, uh, you know, let these people have it out. But instead, the U.S. has poured 60, 70 billion dollars, who knows, uh, into, into this black hole where half the weapons are going out to fight the Russians and be destroyed. And the other half have disappeared. Tens of thousands of people have been killed. And it started out with Putin wanting, after a huge provocation, it was usually provoked actually with NATO and, and the Maidan re re revolution and so forth, just to re regain Crimea for Russia, which is for the last 300 years has always been Russian, and to uh, stop the fighting of the Ukrainians against those two breakaway provinces who declared independence, incidentally, nobody's aware of this in the West, in 2014, they seceded from the Ukraine, and they've been fighting a war against the Ukrainians since 2014. So uh, we just wanted to solve those two problems. That's why he didn't call it a war. That's why he called it a special military operation. But it's gotten out of control. And uh, at this point, uh, while the U.S. government is bankrupting itself uh, with, you know, it's all borrowed money that they're using to fight this war, uh, I don't know what's going to happen uh, with it. I just, I just hope that, you know, that idiot Zelensky, you know, packs up and says, "Sorry, we're going home. Keep the keep Crimea, and we're not going to f fight a war against the Donbas anymore." And kind of live and let. Will he do that? Eh, no. Probably not. No, no, because he's got, the, he's got the backing of the U.S. and many other countries, and of course, as a former actor, it 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 it's good for him to be on the stage. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And, and and the average Muppet out there automatically assumes that the Russians are, you know, the bad evil guys. bad guys. I mean, look, there's no good guys in, in world politics. They're all bad guys. But in, in this case, uh, uh, the Ukrainians are, I feel very badly for the Ukrainian people who are basically being held hostage by a an idiot government, but uh, it's uh, it's a pity. Do you think this is one of these wars that is just going to keep going on and on and on and on and on? Well, actually, we don't know what's actually happening on the front because it's Russian propaganda to say one thing and Ukrainian and American and Western propaganda Let's say the other thing. I mean, it, it, it's long been said that in in war, truth is the first casualty. So we don't really know what's going on uh, right now. 
Hmm. Seems like I have. A yeah, she's got lots of fighting. shadows coming in. People are going to say he's, yeah, he's in the shadow. He's out of the shadow. <laughs> what it is? It's sunset here on the. So on the, the sun is booming in. Yeah, booming and on because your... of the way the window is formed, <laughs> you're just getting. <laughs> Well, look, anyway. let's, let's, you know what we'll do? We'll wrap it up for now. I'm going to bring you back on if that's okay. I love having a, a, a chat with you because you bring so much sensibility to a nonsensical world. Uh, but let's wrap it up. From what I hear um, in this conversation, Doug, you're saying be a bit of a contrarian. Uh, while all the people are saying we're going to turn green, uh, the opportunity lies in oil, gas, uh, the precious metals, and uranium. Uh, and potentially coal as well. Exactly. That's that, and natural gas. Natural gas, of course, because uh, in the U.S., natural gas right now is about nine dollars per MCF. But the Europeans are paying. Uh, I don't know. They're paying fifty. Mm. Uh, so eventually, uh, for a number of reasons, uh, liquefaction and so forth. Although that's very expensive, uh, world prices tend to normalize, and. Uh, as long as this uh, brouhaha in the Ukraine goes on, uh, natural gas prices are not going to come down, uh, at least not much. So, yeah, I like natural gas, even though it's historically expensive by U.S. standards, but only by U.S. standards. And ladies and gentlemen, go and check out Petrobras because Doug likes that one as well. Doug, thanks so much for your time. I'll let you go so that you don't get blinded by the light uh, there in Virginia. And uh, next time we chat in a couple of months' time, who knows what uh, what the future will hold, but I really appreciate your views. Thanks, Kerry. It could be a totally different world once again when I next see you. Thanks so much for joining me today. Thanks.